it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Dead by Dawn Part 1 Josh glanced up at the long row of identical cubicles, watching with mild annoyance as his fellow workers rushed about, hurriedly packing their bags, slamming their belongings inside with careless haste, as they argued and shouted, shoving and pushing each other out of the way. Above the noise of their raised voices, the intercom repeated its blaring message, instructing them to evacuate the building in an orderly manner. The message played on a loop as a constant background noise, one that greatly annoyed Josh. He sighed, in disbelief at what he was seeing, how quickly everything had fallen apart. His co-workers were in a full-blown panic, running about and fighting with each other, whipped into a frenzy by the reports of the mainstream media. Their terror overtaking them, causing them to panic, as they all rushed to gather their things and leave. Just a few days before, the world had been normal. The fungal pandemic had been just a story on the news, one everyone had mostly ignored. The media had wanted to keep panic down, to stop the riot and looting that would accompany a pandemic. Well, in the pre-pandemic world, life had been the same as it had always been, as good as it could be since the accident, an event that still haunted Josh, one he found very difficult, if not impossible, to put behind him. He packed his bag, just as he'd been told to, tossing in the few items he deemed worthy of carrying back home with him, which weren't many. He'd already gotten most of his things days before, having had some idea of the events that would soon unfold across the world. Around him, people chatted in hushed panic whispers. There were rumours spreading about the new fungal infection, one that had come from South America, spreading quickly into the United States. Officially, there was no information on the virus, the mainstream media refused to give details about it. So far there were no reported cases in Canada, as they sealed off their border with America very early on in the outbreak. Josh feared that it would soon spread, as it was very dangerous, though the media had attempted to suppress the information. Josh had viewed various online clips in which he'd seen the hidden effects of the fungus, an infection which grew on the brain, causing those afflicted by the fungi to become uncontrollably violent, attacking and biting anything nearby. And this was what the media had hoped to hide, to avoid mass panic. As such, a virus could prove to be the end of their nation. Already America had gone dark. No news had been heard from it in days. With a final report stating that the government had collapsed, Josh slammed his locker shut jogging quickly down the hall, moving along with a mass of workers as they fled, moving quickly towards the building's exit. He scanned the faces of those around him, looking from person to person, in an attempt to make certain that his friend also got out safely. There were only two people left that Josh was close to, Christopher and Samantha. Well, Christopher had been his friend since childhood, a nerdy and quiet young man who often played Dungeons and Dragons with Josh on the weekends. Christopher was planning on leaving town with his family to move to some other part of the country, which he thought might be safer than where he currently was, a location dangerously close to the American border. Josh could hardly blame him for leaving, but he was less than pleased with being left almost alone to face the outbreak. Christopher was one of only two of Josh's former group of friends who he still talked to. There had been a time when he and his friends had been very close, some years before. Most of them had attended school with him and Christopher, doing things together on the weekends. The group had consisted of Josh, Christopher, Matthew and Michael, as well as Emily and Jess, Matthew and Michael's girlfriends. They often met at Josh's home, where they spent time with both him and his sister Hannah, as well as her best friend Samantha. Josh had broken off contact with nearly all these former friends, speaking only to Christopher and Samantha, who were the only people that Josh didn't blame for the death of his sister who were the only people Josh didn't blame for the death of his sisters. Hannah and Bethany had died as part of a cruel prank, one that Josh was certain had been intentionally harmful. Nearly all of his friends had been part of the prank, with Michael being the ringleader. It had happened at Josh's family cottage, high up on Black Mountain, 
ending with both of his sisters falling to their deaths over a cliff. Due to this prank, Josh hoped never to see any of them again after what they'd done. He walked forward, shaking his head to dispel these unpleasant memories. In the months since he'd lost his sisters, Josh and Samantha had grown close. She was the best friend of his late sister, a very kind and outgoing person. Samantha was tall, with very fair hair and bright blue eyes. Hannah had introduced the pair of them during one of her sleepovers. For a while, they'd spent time together after work. And then the outbreak had begun. A few days into the outbreak, just after the US had gone dark, Samantha had moved into his home after her parents had failed to come home for several days, making her feel uneasy. Josh had welcomed this, happy that he and Samantha would get to be close, as he didn't want to let her out of his sight. Josh took out his cell phone, looking to see if Samantha had texted him. He soon found Christopher among the crowd, waving at him vigorously. The two surged forward with the mob, battering out the front doors of the building to swarm out onto the streets, all of them eager to get home to either barricade themselves in or flee further north to put distance between themselves and the fungal infection as it was spreading like wildfire. Josh waited for the mob to clear, eager to speak to Christopher before he left. The two walked over to each other, glancing out at the small town in which they lived. It was a quiet, quaint place, a peaceful mountain town, popular among sportsmen for its hunting and fishing opportunities. It consisted of about a hundred different homes and businesses, which were divided into two neighbourhoods. Josh, it's good to see you one last time. I'll be leaving early tomorrow morning. My family wants to get further north to escape the infection. Hopefully it won't cross our borders. But we can never be too careful, Christopher announced. Josh nodded. Do whatever you feel is best. Samantha and I will miss you, Josh replied. The two of them walked down the street at a brisk pace, leaving the office they worked in behind. The whole street was in uproar, as people rushed about to frantically gather last-minute supplies from any stores that still had infantry, which were few. There was already a minor traffic, as dozens tried to flee town. How are you on supplies? Samantha and I have enough for tonight, and then we'll be leaving town. To wait out this mess at my family's cottage, Josh announced. Christopher nodded his agreement. Good. It won't be safe here for much longer. Look, I'd hate to think of either of you getting hurt, he replied. Shots sounded nearby as a scuffle broke out. Several vandals attempted to loot a flat screen from a nearby home. The fight ended with more gunshots, making Josh and Christopher move much faster to stay clear of any violence. Christopher lived nearby, in a two-story home, located about midway through their small town. His home was surrounded on all sides by a wooden fence, one that would be latched if the need should arise. Josh and Christopher crossed the street. I'll need to be getting ready to leave. I can't say if we'll see each other again. Goodbye, Josh. I hope you and Samantha manage to reach that cottage, Christopher stated. Goodbye, Christopher. Make sure to get as far north as you can and do whatever you do, but don't get bit, Josh replied. The two then parted ways, with Josh continuing down the street, making his way towards the library, where he knew that Samantha worked. He had to pick her up and bring her home, before the whole town fell into chaos and panic. Soon, the infection would reach Canada. For all he knew, it might already have. Josh quickened his pace, making his way back down the street, towards where he knew the library was. Samantha placed the final book back on the shelf, reaching all the way up to the top. So far her day had gone on well enough. It seemed that the library was the only place in town that wasn't being ransacked by some unruly mob in search of supplies. Since arriving for her final day of work at the library, Samantha had heard the sounds of rioting and shouting from outside. So far, she'd seen only a single customer, a middle-aged woman, who'd checked out several books on survivalism, books which Samantha was certain she would never return, if uh, there was still a library to return it to, which Samantha doubted. She walked out of the section she stood in, 
wondering how she would finish what was left of her shift. Her heels clacked against the hardwood floor beneath her feet, her dress swishing as she adjusted her name tag, making her way over to the front desk, where she sat when she wasn't stocking shelves or aiding customers. Her desk was near the front of the library, allowing her to see who came in and out. For most of the day, she'd sat on the computer, trying to uncover what information she could about the infection that was ravaging America. Well, whatever it was seemed to be spreading very rapidly, making her wonder if it might be airborne. Samantha did a quick search, looking for videos or articles relating to any potential patients of the infection. She'd already searched YouTube for any such content, finding nothing of value there that hadn't already been censored. Now she found herself on BitChute, one of the few sites that lacked corporate censorship. She had some luck now in locating a few low-quality cell phone videos, all of which had a great many views. She clicked on one, allowing it to play. The video began in front of a hospital, one which had a chaotic crowd before it, screaming and shouting. The crowd had surrounded a handful of fighting patients as they struggled upon the ground. Patients were atop a security guard, biting and scratching him madly, as the person filming the video watched. No one in the crowd had the courage to separate the struggling men, as the security guard screamed. A shout from behind the cameraman caused him to turn his head, pointing his camera at a group of soldiers who'd arrived, all of them wearing black combat armor, with the word FEDRA written on their chests in bold white letters. Everyone get back! demanded one of the men, aiming his rifle at the crowd, who scattered away in terror, raising their hands above their heads. Light him up, the soldier shouted. His men all opened fire on the struggling people, their bullets tearing them to shreds. The video cut out after this, leaving Samantha to wonder what she'd just seen. The video had left her shaken, making her wonder just what this bizarre infection was. Samantha shook her head as she exited Bitchute, deciding to read for the rest of her shift. She had a few books sitting on her desk, which she would read when not assisting customers. Before she could pick up one of her books, though, Samantha was disturbed by a loud thud from elsewhere in the library. The noise startled her, making her gasp. She turned her head to glance in the direction which the sound had originated from. Hello? Who's there? she called, receiving only silence as an answer. For a moment she stood there, wondering just what she would do. She'd seen no one come in, the last visitor having left early that morning. Samantha only had a single co-worker with her, an elderly woman, Beth. She hadn't seen Beth since she started her shift several hours before, assuming her to be off doing some task elsewhere in the library. Samantha edged forward, searching for the source of the noise. She scanned the rows of bookshelves around her, finding nothing out of order. Perhaps some large volume fell off a shelf. That must be what I heard, thought Samantha. She walked down the center of the rows of shelves, finding no books lying on the floor. It was all just as she'd left it. Upon reaching the back of the library, Samantha paused, glancing around. She stood before the restrooms, wondering just what on earth she'd heard. Just as she was about to return to her desk, a second bang sounded, this one even louder than the last. The sound had come from the women's restroom. Samantha slowly approached the door. Beth, is that you? She called, knocking softly on the door. For a moment she was answered by nothing but silence, then a quiet groan could be heard from within. Fearing that Beth was in some sort of distress, Samantha pushed open the door to the restroom, stepping inside and searching for her. The old woman lay sprawled in the middle of the floor, still as a board, her eyes wide, fixed in a look of terror. Beth had a chunk of flesh torn from her shoulder, the floor around her covered by a layer of blood, its strong coppery scent hanging in the air, nearly strong enough to make her gag as it filled her nose. Samantha took several steps backwards, as she attempted to process what she was seeing. Beth, she gasped. The old woman stayed still, not hearing Samantha. Beth, what on earth happened? Who did this to you? Samantha inquired. 
She slowly approached the body, giving Beth's foot a light kick. The old woman still refused to move, even after Samantha had called her name several times. The subtle dread filled the room as Beth twitched, letting out a muffled growl as if she were angry. This alarmed Samantha, causing her to take a step back towards the exit. Beth! Beth! What's wrong? She stammered, wondering why the normally mild-mannered librarian was growling like a wild cat. Beth sat up with a jerk, snapping her head to glare at Samantha so quickly that her neck popped loudly. Samantha's back touched the wall as she stood off to the side, waiting to see what would happen. Beth growled again, this time with even more anger, as she bared her teeth in a snow. Samantha was beginning to wonder if she should, perhaps, just flee. It seemed something had come over Beth, and a noise from elsewhere in the library drew Beth and Samantha's attention. Someone was shouting for Samantha. With relief, she recognized the voice. It was Josh. He'd come to get her earlier than normal, a fact she was now grateful for. She had to reach him before Beth became violent. Reaching out, she quietly began to open the restroom door, hoping that Beth wouldn't notice. Beth backed towards the door, glad that the old woman was temporarily distracted. Samantha was about halfway through the door when Beth leapt to her feet, letting out a cry of rage, before rushing at Samantha, her teeth bared in a snarl. Samantha threw herself backwards, falling to the floor of the library. Instantly, she kicked out both feet, keeping the bathroom door from opening, even as Beth slammed violently against it. Samantha, cried Josh, sprinting over to where she lay. He glanced over at the door to the women's restroom, listening as Beth threw herself against it. Soon, the door burst open, allowing the angry creature to spill out into the library screaming a primal roar of rage. Josh reacted quickly, drawing his pistol and firing into her head at point-blank range, the gunshot cutting off the infected woman's cry of rage. The creature that had once been Beth fell to the floor, a smoking hole in her head. Josh lowered the pistol, glancing down at Samantha. She sat with her back to one of the bookshelves, looking up at Josh. Josh extended a hand down to her. We have to leave now, he stated. And Samantha accepted his help, rising quickly to her feet. Where on earth did you get a gun? I thought they were all kept up at your family's lodge, she inquired. I uh, got this off a dead cop. The whole town has gone mad. There's some sort of riot in the streets. Several people are dead, he informed her. He then led Samantha by the hand, pulling her towards the exit of the library. Just hold on a moment. I need to grab my bag. I grabbed several books this morning. Survival manuals and the like. I thought they might prove useful, she informed him. Josh nodded, releasing her arm. Okay, grab what you can, quickly. We must leave town as quickly as possible, Josh shouted. Samantha rushed over to her desk, grabbing the canvas bag which sat beside her chair. The bag had several books inside, gathered by Samantha that morning. At the start of her final shift. She then rejoined Josh, both of them bursting out of the library onto the streets of their once peaceful town. The whole town was in an uproar. Sirens blared, people screamed, and gunshots rang out. A car had been set on fire in front of the library, filling the air with black smoke and fumes. The store surrounding the library had already been looted by a panicked mob who were fleeing in mass down the street. Several in their group had already been infected, and they began to attack their companions, biting and clawing at them like wild beasts. This way, Josh shouted, leading Samantha down the street. They surged forward with the fleeing mob, moving as one great mass towards the west side of town, where the residents were. Where the residents resided in their clustered together suburban homes. Behind them a gas station exploded, rocking them to the ground. It sound deafening. The explosion drew in even more of the infected. They surged out of the forest, sprinting at the fleeing mob, which quickened their pace, 
Hearing the distant screams of the infected, there were several people running ahead of Josh and Samantha. All of them had been rioting just a few moments before. Now, the panic of their situation had set in. Up ahead of them, a group of infected burst out of an alleyway, brutally attacking a group of fleeing men. The infected wore the orange vests of construction workers, sinking their teeth and nails into the men, tearing great chunks out of them. Josh and Samantha ran past the men, not able to help them as the infected tore them to pieces, ripping them apart. They could see their home in the distance, where their car was already loaded, ready for them to make their escape. All around them, the infected surged, met with gunfire by several members of the fleeing mob, their gunfire drawing the attention of the infected, allowing Samantha to bolt for their car. Josh was just behind her, urging her to move forward. He had the pistol in his hand, ready to shoot any infected that got in their way. Samantha reached the passenger side of their door, yanking it open and throwing herself inside. She slammed the car door, blocking an infected that had wanted to grab her. It slammed against the door, looking wildly around as the mob screamed and shouted around it, drawing its attention away from her. They charged at a nearby old man, and the infected tore his throat out, knocking him roughly to the ground. Samantha turned away from the carnage as Josh threw himself into the driver's seat. Igniting the engine and jamming his foot down on the gas, the car rocketed forward, accelerating away from this scene of carnage. Racing down the street, sailing past several infected who roared with rage at the fleeing vehicle. As they neared the edge of town, Samantha cast a final look back in the rearview mirror, watching as the town burned knowing she would likely never return. Hours later, Samantha glanced out of the car window, looking down at the fresh sheet of snow that blanketed the road ahead of them. It had been snowing for about an hour, a steady winter storm setting in as they neared the mountains. They moved swiftly down an abandoned highway, sitting in silence, with only the rushing of winter wind to serve as background noise. She and Josh hadn't known just how powerful the infection was, all they had known had been complete lies from the mainstream media. The infection spread rapidly as its violent carrier spread it through their bites, infecting anyone they could catch. By the time they'd escaped their town, a majority of its citizens had been infected, and those who weren't killed in the fight became mindless killers controlled by the fungi growing in the brain. The whole country seemed to be in chaos. Their car radio had gone silent, after a final emergency transmission, one that had been cut off about halfway through, when the infected had swarmed the studio, leaving she and Josh to ride in silence. Coasting down the abandoned highway, watching snow fall from the grey skies above, it now coated the branches of nearby trees, turning the green branches white. There were very few other cars on the road. Since leaving town, they'd passed only two cars, each of them speeding away to some unknown destination. Samantha hoped they were smart enough to avoid the major cities. I wonder how many people died back there. I've never seen anything like it, Samantha said. She glanced over at Josh, who had a white knuckle grip on the steering wheel. Oh, this infection is far worse than they predicted. It's worse than anything I could have imagined. Oh, we need help. Someone has to put those things down, Josh pointed out. Samantha glanced back out of her window. The road they drove down was surrounded on all sides by a deep forest, with thick maple and oak trees. She scanned the tree line, searching for any infected. So far, she'd seen none. The forest was peaceful and tranquil, covered by a layer of snow. A herd of deer grazed beneath the shade of a maple tree, glancing up to look at their passing car. I wonder if this infection can affect animals, Samantha asked. She'd seen how it affected humans, and the thought of an infected bear or moose made her more than a little uneasy. She hoped that the infection only infected humans, or else the mountains could prove to be very dangerous. Oh, I hope not, Josh replied. How much further to Black Mountain? Samantha inquired. Oh, we should arrive soon. I think it's just a few more miles down the highway, answered Josh. Samantha nodded. 
After about five minutes, they rounded a corner, coming upon a pair of parked cars on the side of the road. Two black SUVs, covered by a thin layer of snow, making Josh think that they'd been there for more than a few minutes. Two men stood leaning against the cars, and they gave Josh an angry glare, looking he and Samantha up and down as if sizing them up. The two watched the road, wearing black leather jackets and combat boots. Each had a pistol tucked into his waistband, which they rested their hands on. The men gave Josh a stern glare, scanning both he and Samantha with their eyes, glaring at Samantha and Josh and muttering to each other. One of the men pointed at them, saying something that Samantha couldn't make out. His companion shook his head, refusing to move from his spot. I don't like this at all. What on earth are those men doing out here in the middle of nowhere? Josh stated. He had a growing sense of unease. If the men did have some sort of ill intentions for them, then he and Samantha would have to deal with them alone. Neither of them had cell phone service anymore, and even if they had, Josh doubted any police would be able to respond. Oh, maybe their cars broke down, Samantha suggested. Josh shook his head. Oh, I'm not taking any chances, he replied, accelerating even faster. Samantha watched the men in her rearview mirror as they disappeared into the distance. She and Josh drove for about another twenty minutes, the roads becoming long and windy as they moved further up into the mountains. Soon Josh and Samantha arrived at their destination, pulling the car to the side of the road, nearby a rocky section of forest that sloped uphill to the slopes of Black Mountain above them. Oh, we're finally here, Samantha gasped, glancing up at the summit of an immense mountain tall and imposing with rocky, jagged peaks. Black Mountain, a rather impressive section of the Canadian Rockies. It was here that Josh's family had their cottage, high up on the mountain, accessible by gondola. Josh hoped that the lodge would prove to be safe, due to its remote location, not easily accessible without a lengthy hike. Samantha stepped out of the car, carrying the bag she brought with her from the library. Back had four books inside of it, all of which were about some form of survivalism. She walked to the back of their car, opening the door to the back seat. There, sitting across the back seat, was her bastard sword, a double-edged sword with a staghorn handle long enough to accommodate two hands. The sword had been gifted to Samantha by her uncle, who was an avid sword collector. Samantha took the sword in her hands, drawing the blade from its sheath. The sword was well balanced, made to deliver a powerful cut with its wide blade. She sheathed it, using a strap on its sheath to carry it. Josh opened the passenger door on his side of the car, retrieving a pump-action shotgun, which he'd brought with him from the lodge. The shotgun had been his father's, something he'd used to hunt before the pandemic. Once they'd armed themselves, Josh and Samantha abandoned the car, after piling a small amount of snow atop it to make it appear as though it had been sitting outside for some time. The bag with the books was the only luggage which she had. She and Josh already had most of their belongings up at the lodge, having brought them there days before. They walked towards a nearby path that led deep into the forest. The steep mountain path was covered by snow, snaking its way up the hill, surrounded by trees and boulders. A small sign at the head of the trail warned Samantha to be wary of bears. Samantha and Josh began their hike up the path. Walking into the forest, their backs to the road behind them, the only thing that could be heard was the crunch of the snow beneath their feet and the quiet whistle of the wind through the trees, which carried the distant howl of wolves upon it, their mournful cry sending a shiver down Samantha's spine. She and Josh wearily gazed at the dark forest around them, straining their ears to pick up any nearby sounds, scanning the tree line as they hiked steadily upwards, stepping carefully over tree roots and being pelted with snow falling from the branches overhead. Who were those men on the road? Samantha whispered, glancing over at Josh. He hiked alongside her, his breath coming in a long, white cloud, shotgun held over his shoulder, his eyes keen and alert. I have no idea. I suspect that they're wading to ambush travelers, Josh replied.
Samantha frowned. Let's hope they don't follow us, she stated, and Josh nodded his agreement. Yeah, I hope that as well, he replied. There was little else around them other than grey and white, the ground covered by snow and boulders. An owl hooted somewhere in the darkness, taking flight above their heads, to hunt for whatever rodents it might find in the snow. Samantha looked down the path, she could see the distant gate that closed off their property from outsiders. There was a whole section of the land that Josh's family owned which was closed off from the outside, beyond which the gondola sat. The gate was kept locked when not in use, as they'd previously had problems with break-ins, some deranged old man who tried to get onto their property. Samantha shivered in the cold air as she and Josh reached the gate. Stopping, Josh fished a key out of his pocket, the old lock on the iron gate gave him some trouble, though it did eventually give way, the cold having made it stiff. It swung open with a loud creak, making Samantha grimace. The gate could certainly use a bit of oil, she pointed out, stepping through it. Josh nodded his agreement, slamming it shut behind them and locking it. Well, hopefully it proves to be sturdy enough to hold back any infected, he replied. There wasn't a lot to see inside the wall other than the gondola in its control room, and a small utility shed, which held an assortment of random tools. The gondola would take them up the mountain to a remote cabin, where they should have safety, at least for a while. Let's go, I have to fire up the boiler before it gets any colder up there, reminded Josh. Samantha offered no argument, quickening her pace. They walked past the old shed, stepping up onto the gondola's platform. You should go and sit down. I'll fire up the gondola, directed Josh. He stepped into the small control room, closing the door behind him. Samantha continued onto the gondola. It had recently been repainted, giving it a fresh coat of red and white paint. The gondola had originally been shades of blue and white. She slid open its door, stepping inside and sitting down. The gondola whirred to life, its single interior light switching on. Soon, Josh emerged from the control room, stepping onto the gondola and closing the door behind them. He then flipped a switch inside, causing the gondola to begin its slow ascent up the mountain, rumbling and creaking as it moved. Josh sat down next to Samantha, glancing out the window at the forest below. The only visible light coming from the distant streetlights, which still dimly glowed, flickering. The forest was long and dark a white expanse of snow and trees, where packs of wolves were said to hunt, the night wind often carrying their songs on it. Josh felt a sense of relief. They'd almost made it home. Oh, it's quite the view, isn't it? commented Samantha, nodding down at the scene below. Yeah, my parents always said as much, as did my sisters, stated Josh. He recalled the prank then, the one that had killed both of his sisters. Oh, it feels strange to be back here. Yet at the same time, it also feels really serene, Josh announced. Samantha nodded. I understand. I miss them too, she confided. They rode the rest of the way up in silence, wondering what had become of Michael, the perpetrator of the prank that had killed Josh's sisters wondering if he'd been torn apart by some pack of infected. Josh hoped that he had. It'd be a fitting end for him. Soon the lodge came into view. It was a large and cosy home, built in the style of an old hunter's lodge. It had two floors and a very deep basement, in which a boiler could be found. The boiler heated and powered the whole home, being fed by heated steam. The lodge had been built near a collection of old mine shafts, which had been abandoned long ago. Not having been in use for over fifty years, the property which his family owned was quite extensive, stretching over many acres. The gondola landed at its control room, on a cliff high up in the mountains. Come on, we're nearly there, Josh informed. He still had opened the doors, stepping out of the gondola, before offering Samantha his hand and helping her out. They stood at the top of a sheer cliff, one not far from the cabin. There was a short path ahead of them. They walked quickly up the path, now confident that they were alone. 
There was no chance that the infected could climb this high into the mountains, not without a really good reason. He and Samantha recalled all the times they'd come to that very cabin, on one retreat or another. Often Josh's sister had invited Samantha, while he'd invited Christopher, for weekends of hiking or sledding. Oh, the old vacations had always been really enjoyable for all involved. Snow swirled in the air around their heads. Oh, I loved it here, Samantha sighed. She and Josh now stood near the lodge's front steps, looking up at it. Do you still have a key? Samantha inquired. Josh nodded, pulling the key from his pocket. He climbed the brick steps to the lodge, breathing a sigh of relief as he slid his key in the door, gripping the freezing cold knob in his hand. The lock clicked, allowing Josh to shove the door open. Instantly, he was hit by the smell of the lodge, a smell which filled his nose. The lodge smelt of wood fires and the flowery scent of lavender. Often Samantha and his sisters had enjoyed the scent of diffused lavender, giving the whole house a flowery aroma. Josh stood aside, allowing Samantha to step into the lodge. Oh, we're home, Josh stated, shutting the door behind them. Part 2 Samantha sat up in bed, stretching and yawning. A glance around their bedroom revealed it was still pitch black, meaning that it was likely very early in the morning. With a groggy sigh, she turned over in bed, casting a brief glance over at the LED clock, which sat on her bedside table. Its glowing screen displayed the numbers 6.30am, confirming her suspicions. Samantha relaxed yet again, laying back into her pillow. She had no intention of getting up early. She was still quite tired after a very late night. Beside her, Josh stirred in his sleep. Oh, what time is it? He grumbled, refusing to even open his eyes. It's about 6.30. Go back to sleep, Samantha replied. Josh turned over in his bed, his breathing once again growing heavy as he drifted off to sleep. She closed her eyes, recalling the events of the previous day the screams of the infected replaying in her mind, mingled with breaking glass and gunshots. They had nearly killed both she and Josh when they tried to escape their hometown, fleeing the horde of infected, who'd attacked a gang of rioters in the streets, resulting in a violent battle in which many on both sides had been killed. She and Josh were now staying in the family lodge, high up in a section of the Canadian Rockies, known as Black Mountain. Here, the infected should be unable to reach them, as the lodge was in a very remote and treacherous section of the mountains, one that was not at all well known, meaning that no one should be able to find them up there. The only place nearby was an abandoned sanatorium, one that hadn't been used in decades, not since some mine collapse in the early 1900s, one which had killed a number of miners. Samantha managed to finally slip back into sleep, as she wondered just what she and Josh would do now, her body slowly relaxing into the soft mattress beneath her, Josh's presence serving to comfort her. For hours she slept peacefully, warm beneath thick blankets, finally able to relax after that long day. Well, their sleep was so deep that neither of them heard the muffled gunshots from down in the valley, a faint echoing boom that was just barely audible one hardly loud enough to disturb the sleepers. Eventually, Samantha began to stir in her sleep as her dreams became more bizarre. In the dream, she found herself walking through the forest nearby where the lodge was, along the same path she and Josh had travelled earlier that day. When they'd first arrived at the land which this family owned, it was dark outside, with a full moon hanging low in the sky above her head, illuminating the forest with its pale light, which cast long shadows across the forest floor. Samantha glanced around her as a feeling of unease began to grow in her. She could sense that someone was watching her. She scanned the tree line, freezing in place, her pulse quickening upon seeing that she was surrounded on all sides by a collection of masked figures dressed in black robes who stood silently, clutching bows and arrows in their hands 
partially concealed behind the trunks of trees. Their masks were bizarre and ornate, carved to be like animals, painted with bright and garish colours, like something she would have expected to see worn by some jungle tribe. The masked men all whispered in a language, one she did not recognise. Not one of the figures moved, standing motionless, with only their cold, uncaring eyes visible. They eyed Samantha as a hunter would its prey, with a detached sort of hostility. She cast a sweeping, nervous glance behind her, only to see even more of the masked figures, crouched in the bushes behind her, staring up at her with unnerving intensity. They moved slowly, rising to their feet, with the daggers held in their hands. <laughs> Josh! she shouted, her hand reaching for her sword, her hand reaching for her sword as she retreated up the path. All at once a shrill shriek exploded from the trees which surrounded her, startling Samantha and making her ears ring. The shriek came from the masked men, who stood blowing into bizarre whistles, ones that produced this bizarre noise that filled the air. As Samantha fled, she could hear the rhythmic beat of drums in the distance, pounding at a fast and violent pace. The masked figures in the tree line stayed where they were, refusing to draw any closer to Samantha, instead choosing to stare her down with their cold, pitiless eyes. The men who had been crouched in the bushes behind her slowly followed Samantha, their daggers held at their side. Stay back, she shouted, running towards the entrance to the gondola. The men pursuing her said nothing, as they advanced on her with their long daggers. Samantha had nearly reached the gate that led to the gondola, when one of the masked figures stepped into her path, blocking her only escape. She responded by drawing her sword. Get out of the way, she demanded, pointing her blade at the man who stood in her path. He shook his head, reaching back into his quiver for an arrow. You will die here in the wilderness, beyond the reach of the man growled the masked figure, in a voice that sent a chill down Samantha's spine. With a cry of rage, she buried her sword in his chest. The masked figure fell to his knees, disappearing in a puff of black smoke. Well, this puzzled Samantha. She looked for the man she'd stabbed, glancing around the forest, to find that she was now alone. None of the masked figures were there to be seen. All of them had vanished, seemingly into thin air. Samantha awakened with a quiet gasp. The unnerving dream had ended, making her wonder just where on earth it had come from. The masks which the strangers had worn seemed familiar in some way, as if she'd seen them before, though she wasn't sure where. Perhaps she'd seen them in some class, or as part of some film, one she was unable to recall completely. The masked men's whistles had sounded like human shrieks, piercing the night air with their shrill and ear-splitting cries. Samantha had never heard a sound similar to what they had produced, and knew no instrument that could produce one. She turned over in bed to glance over at her digital clock, finding that it was just after 8am. She rolled onto her back yet again, allowing the unnerving dream to fade from her mind. As she snuggled up in the warmth of her blankets, Samantha thought of the radio downstairs, one which might be able to pick up communications from other survivors. From their position atop Black Mountain, she and Josh were able to receive signals from quite far away, due to an old ranger's radio tower which was located on the mountain not far from where they were. If she or Josh could somehow pick up a signal from either the police or the military, then perhaps they could learn more about the fate of the rest of the country. And so far they knew little to nothing, other than that their town had been overrun and destroyed. Well, they presumed that other towns had been destroyed too, or their residents had sealed themselves up at home. After all, they'd hardly encountered any motorists on their long drive to the remote lodge. Samantha sat up in bed, shivering in the cold morning air. Josh was still sleeping, and she decided to head downstairs without him, not wishing to disturb him. Slipping on a housecoat and her slippers, she crept out of their bedroom, taking her sword with her, as she was still unnerved from her vivid dream, which was very fresh in her mind. Upon stepping into the corridor beyond her bedroom, quietly closing the door behind her, realizing that it was quite overcast outside, making the corridor still very dark, Samantha retrieved her flashlight before continuing. Shining its bright beam on the walls around her, where various family pictures hung, 
some she'd herself been a part of. Well, the photos were of happy times, before the tragedy that had killed her best friend, due to that cruel prank played by their former friends. Samantha walked over to the small upstairs window, one that looked out over the valley, which was covered by a layer of snow. The moon was a silvery crescent in the sky, illuminating the valley below with its pale light. Samantha peered over the tops of the trees at the distant abandoned sanatorium, which looked over the deep forest. The old building had always unnerved Samantha. Josh's family had an old squatter removed from it once, some insane old man who'd been stalking the family, one she hoped had moved on to other places. She continued up the corridor, making her way towards the stairs to the first floor. Making her way to the first floor, the stairs creaking beneath her. The sitting room was just as she and Josh had left it, lit only by a single small nightlight. The old fireplace with the head of a deer above it greeted her, its eyes black and lifeless. Well, this made Samantha shiver at the thought of the masked men's cold eyes, which had peered out from behind their primal masks. She switched on her flashlight, its beam cutting through the darkness, as she stepped onto the first floor. The radio was across from the sitting room, in one of the adjacent bedrooms, which was rarely used. It was where Josh stored the radio equipment. Samantha walked by the couch, where their bags still lay in the same place they dropped them the previous night, both of them being so tired that they discarded them upon arrival, deciding not to bother with them until the next day. She made her way over to the bedroom, opening its door with an audible creak, switching on the overhead lights. The room was almost bare, with the only furniture being a bed with no sheets and a small table upon which the old radio sat. The radio had belonged to Josh's father before it had become his. Often he and Josh had sat listening to it late at night, as they could pick up every distant talk radio station from as far away as New York City. Samantha smiled as she thought of all the happy memories he and Josh had had with that old radio. Sitting on the bed, she reached over and switched it on, turning its dial to find a clear station. Most of what she found were music stations, ones with no one speaking on them, as the same set of songs played on repeat. It seems that the whole country had been affected, as she was unable to find any chatter from survivors. She tried to remember the frequency Josh had told her about, one that was for the RCMP dispatch station one which Josh had picked up before, when he and his sister had been using the radio. Samantha slowly twisted the knob, moving it to the place she remembered to be cracked. She found only static, which continued for a few brief moments, only to be replaced by a man's panic shouts, as he made a frantic distress call. Dispatch, this is Unit 119. Our station is surrounded by the infected. We need backup ASAP. The man screamed. Samantha could hear the sounds of explosions and rapid gunfire in the background as the station was attacked by the infected. Unit 119, we have no backup at this time. We've lost contact with nearly all of our bases. Please attempt to hold out until we can manage to send someone, replied a woman's voice. No, we won't last that long. We need backup now. Our ammunition is nearly depleted, retorted Unit 119. Glass broke in the background, and a man was heard screaming, only to be cut off by the screams of dozens of infected. The radio then went silent, without another word being spoken. Samantha wished there was some way she could communicate with the dispatcher. However, she could not. With a sigh, she turned away from the radio, deciding to start breakfast before Josh woke up. Well, we should go and see where the RCMP station is. If any of its radio equipment is still intact, then we could use it to contact the dispatcher you heard. She must know something about what's going on, suggested Josh. He sat across from Samantha at the breakfast table, a steaming spoon of baked bean raised to his mouth. You really want to take that risk? That station was overrun by the infected. It's sure to be very dangerous. And besides, we only have so much gas left in the SUV, and it took us so long to get here, she reminded him. Josh nodded. Yeah, it would be risky. If only there was somewhere closer we could go. We have to talk to someone out there. 
I can't imagine us just sitting here until our food runs out, stated Josh. Samantha nodded, continuing to eat her breakfast. She looked past Josh, staring out of the kitchen window at the snowy slopes of Black Mountain. A narrow path snaked its way up the side of the mountain, leading to an old ranger's tower, sitting near the mountain summit. The tower had been there for some time, but Samantha could recall seeing a couple of RCMP officers who had come to inspect the tower just a few months before the outbreak. It was then that an idea occurred to her. She glanced back at Josh, unsure of whether she should even tell him. The old tower could hold what they needed. However, it was very close to the place where Josh's sisters had died, and neither of them were keen on returning to the site, as it was certain to bring back painful memories for both of them. However, Samantha could still see no point in travelling all the way to the RCMP station, where they might have such equipment in their backyard. We could always, um, go see the old radio tower. The rangers likely left some sort of equipment there, she suggested. Yeah, you're right. I can't believe I never thought of that to begin with, Josh agreed. I mean... It's been there the whole time, right under our noses, he stated. Good, I must admit. Well, I'd like to find out more myself. There has to be someone alive out there, stated Samantha. She slid her empty bowl across the table, rising to her feet. We should go now before another snowstorm has time to roll in, she suggested. Yeah, good idea. We shouldn't have to go too far. The tower is only a short hike away. He agreed. She got dressed, pulling on her jacket and snow boots. Samantha and Josh stepped out of the cabin, their boots crunching in the snow beneath their feet, dark grey snow clouds hanging in the air, with no sun in sight. The air was frigid with flurries of snowflakes falling from the sky. Samantha pulled on a thick pair of gloves, wrapping a scarf tightly around her neck. The two of them began their slow walk towards the old trail, walking uphill past a small shed which sat in Josh's backyard. Above them, the Canadian flag flapped in the breeze, hanging from the flagpole which Josh's father had installed. The trail ahead was long and narrow, rocky and treacherous, covered by at least a few feet of snow. It snaked sharply uphill, winding around the side of the mountain. The path had a sheer, rocky drop-off, one that went far down into the valley below. Watch your step. I doubt anyone could survive a fall from these heights, stated Josh. He looked up the trail at the distant tower, where he hoped to find a working ham radio. The trail was slippery, making progress very slow. Samantha grasped the thin trunks of nearby trees to steady herself, as she tried to keep a safe distance from the edge of the cliff. Where she stood, she could see off for a great distance, over the tops of nearby trees, to the distant highway beyond. The terrain was very rocky on the cliffside, making Samantha more than a little nervous about Josh, who was a few steps ahead of her, moving swiftly, eager to get to the old tower. The old path made Samantha uneasy, as it was very close to the place where Hannah and Bethany had fallen to their deaths. The spot had been blocked off by a section of crime scene tape, which blew loosely in a gust of wind. Their bodies had never been recovered, having fallen somewhere in the valley below. Does it bother you to return here? I know it must be difficult to be back, stated Samantha. Well, I'm not keen on it, Josh replied. He glanced over at the cliff's edge, wondering just what on earth had become of his sisters. He and Samantha had reached the top of the trail. Stepping up onto a section of wood boards placed there by the rangers, Josh looked down at his feet, noticing an object sitting between the boards one that had fallen between them some time ago. Upon picking the object up, Josh felt his heart sink in his chest. It was a cell phone, one that he recognized. The phone was bright pink, with unicorn stickers on its back. Josh turned it over in his hands, looking at its screen. There was no mistaking it. The phone was his sister's. He hadn't seen it since her death, over a year before. Samantha, you need to take a look at this, he shouted, turning to face her, his hands trembling as he held the phone. What is it? Samantha inquired, rushing to his side. 
Her eyes widened as she saw what was in his hand. Where on earth did you find that? She gasped. It's right where you're standing, between those old boards, Josh informed her. Samantha gave him a bewildered look. How is that phone still here? The police investigated Hannah and Bethany's deaths. There's no way they would overlook something like this, she pointed out. Could I see the phone? She inquired, and Josh handed it to her. The phone seemed to be undamaged as far as Samantha could tell. It was, of course, freezing cold, but that was the extent of the damage. How on earth did this get here? Do you think she might have dropped it when she fell? muttered Samantha. Josh shook his head. Maybe, though, if she had dropped it in the fall, I'd have expected its screen to be cracked. I mean, she and Bethany fell from very high up, observed Josh. Samantha handed him back the phone. I wonder how long this was here. There's no way it still works, Josh replied, putting the phone in his pocket. We'll have to try charging it when we get home. Maybe it can tell us something about what happened that night, Samantha replied. They walked the rest of the way to the tower, following the winding trail to the edge of a distant cliff. The tower rested just off of the trail, in a small clearing, surrounded by maple trees. The tall tower was old and rusted, after years of abuse by the elements. A single old ladder led to its top, one that Samantha was less than trustful of. You're not really going to climb that, are you? It's practically ancient, she inquired, glancing over at Josh. That ah, shouldn't be a problem. I think it'll hold my weight, Josh replied, placed a single foot on the lowest rung of the ladder. Slowly placing his full weight on the ladder, it loudly creaked and groaned. See, uh, it's perfectly sturdy, Josh muttered, his voice uncertain. I'm not climbing that. I'll be waiting here when you get back. Be careful, Samantha replied. Here, take this. I don't want it breaking if I fall, Josh requested, holding his sister's phone out to Samantha. She took it from him and stood back, watching as Josh scaled the ladder. He made quick progress, ignoring the groaning and creaking of the ladder below him, which just managed to hold his weight. Once he'd reached the top, Josh crawled into the tower via a trap door on its bottom. The interior of the tower was covered in a layer of dust, and it smelt strongly of mildew. No one had been there for over a year, not since its radio had last been serviced. Josh glanced around, looking at old filing cabinets which lined the walls of the tower. The old radio sat just a few feet from where Josh had entered the tower, and upon further inspection it seemed to be in good working order. Josh switched it on, turning the dials to several different stations until he came to the RCMP station, which Samantha had been listening to earlier that day. Hello? Is anyone there? I'm calling from the old ranger station on Black Mountain. I was told that I could reach someone on this frequency, Josh declared. For a moment he stood, waiting, wondering if the woman Samantha had heard would respond. Hello? My name's Amanda. I'm a dispatcher for the RCMP. Who am I speaking to? She inquired. Josh smiled, glad that he was finally able to contact someone. Samantha stood at the bottom of the tower, looking up the rusted ladder which Josh had climbed. The wind howled, chilling her to the bone. Another snowstorm was on its way. She could see its grey clouds in the distance, approaching rapidly. She wished Josh would take what he needed and come back quickly. She wasn't keen on staying out any longer than they had to. The forest was quiet, with the distant sound of wolves being carried on the wind. It was eerie being alone. Her dream the night before had greatly unnerved her. She turned back to the ladder, watching the tree line that surrounded her, almost expecting to find the masked figures waiting for her there, their shrill whistles clutched in their hands. The forest was deserted, its trees swaying gently in the wind. It concealed no hidden dangers. She and Josh were truly alone. Samantha took out the cell phone Josh had handed her, looking at it yet again. It was in very good condition, a fact that surprised Samantha, as she would have expected it to be frozen solid or soaking wet after over a year on the cold ground of the slopes. On a whim, she pressed its power button, not expecting anything to happen. 
Her jaw dropped when the phone flickered to life for a split second, flashing an image of one of the animal masks from her dream. The image was only on the screen for a second, before the phone's battery died completely. The shock of seeing the image nearly made her drop the phone. As her heart began to race, it made no sense. How on earth had the phone held a charge for that long? Surely it should have stopped working long ago. Samantha had no explanation for this. She had to know why such an image was on Hannah's phone. It made no sense how a mask she'd seen in her dreams could be connected to Hannah. She tried to get the screen to turn back on, but it had died entirely. The phone would be of no use without a charge. A sound above her startled Samantha, making her reach for her sword. To her relief, she found that it was only Josh, coming back to her with the radio equipment. Oh, I'm glad you're back, she sighed, deciding that she would not mention what she'd seen to Josh. If she told him that she'd seen a mask from her dreams on his dead sister's phone, then he might think her mad. Josh descended the ladder, dropping to the ground beside Samantha. What did you manage to find up there? Samantha inquired. Josh turned to look at her, brushing snow off of his jacket. Oh, there was a working two-way radio, which I used to make contact with the dispatcher you spoke with earlier. Her name's Amanda, and she told me that most of the RCMP stations have been overrun by the infected, he informed her. Oh, I'm glad she's still alive. I must admit I feared the worst after the transmission I heard from the RCMP station. Did Amanda tell you what happened to the rest of the stations, the ones that hadn't been overrun? Asked Samantha. Oh, she's lost contact with mostly all of them, except for a handful in small towns, which were isolated from the outbreaks in the cities. Look, Amanda warned me not to travel to any large city unless I'm prepared for a fight, Josh informed her. Samantha sighed. This had not been what she wanted to hear. She knew the infection had been bad, but had no idea how fast it would spread. She stood silently for a moment, thinking over what Josh had just said. Let's hope we don't have to go into any cities. If we do, we're going to need more people, she replied, and Josh nodded. Oh, we should go home. Another storm's on the way, and I prefer to get a fire going in the bedroom before it arrives, said Josh. Samantha was about to reply when a sudden shout made her look towards the forest. The noise made Josh raise his shotgun, fearing that one of the infected was about to rush them. Samantha drew her sword, looking up to find that a young woman had charged out of the tree line. Well, she appeared to be in bad shape, wearing ragged clothes and bleeding from a wound on her arm. Help, please, she shouted. Wait, stop right there. Josh screamed, pointing his shotgun at her. She froze, throwing up her arms. Don't shoot! I'm not one of them! She shouted. Samantha looked the woman over, her eyes widening as she recognized her. Jess! She gasped, shocked to see her former friend again. Neither she nor Josh had seen Jess in over a year. Not since her boyfriend Michael had pulled that prank that had gotten Josh's sisters killed. Jess was in a bad condition after running through rough terrain for almost a mile, fleeing from something. How on earth did you get here? Josh growled. He wasn't eager to see Jess again, not after what her boyfriend had done. I escaped from the abandoned sanatorium just up the mountain. There's this group of people staying there. Bad people, she explained. Samantha drew closer to Jess, looking her up and down. You're hurt, she stated. Jess nodded. Michael tried to shoot me. I think he's with whoever's staying in the sanatorium. Oh, I don't know what's wrong with him. He's been acting strange for a long time, she stammered, trembling like a leaf. The wound didn't appear to be too bad. It was a simple graze wound, one that Samantha would be able to deal with easily. She turned to look at Josh. We need to take her back to the lodge. I can see to her wounds. Uh, they're not too bad, she stated. Josh frowned. You really want to help her? He asked, glaring over at Jess. Yes, we can't just leave her like this. Besides, she might be able to tell us more about what happened on the night we lost your sisters, reasoned Samantha. Josh groaned, lowering his shotgun. Fine, he muttered. Hours later, 
Back at the lodge, Samantha sat on the couch next to Jess. Her wounds had proven not to be as bad as she thought, being mostly cuts and bruises, with a single graze from a bullet on her arm. Samantha had disinfected and cleaned it, wrapping a bandage around Jess's arm. There, that should stop any infections from setting in, Samantha said, and Jess nodded. Thank you, she replied. Samantha nodded in response, glancing over at Josh, who sat across from them. Did you charge Hannah's cell phone? inquired Samantha. Yeah, I put it on charge as soon as we got home a few hours ago. Should be done by now, replied Josh. He stood up and walked across the room, retrieving Hannah's phone from where he'd left it. The phone was fully charged when Josh checked it. He then picked it up from the table, scrolling through all of the photos and videos his sister had taken before she passed. His eyes narrowing as he came across several bizarre pictures, ones which he'd never seen before, that didn't look like something his sister would have photographed. Samantha, take a look at these. I've no idea where she took them, but they're really strange, announced Josh. He handed the phone to Samantha, who gasped upon seeing an image of the same sort of mask she'd seen in her dreams. Josh, I... I know this is going to sound as if I've gone mad, but I've seen this mask before, she told him. Where did you see it? inquired Josh. In a dream, one I had last night. Well, at first, I thought nothing of it. Then I saw the same mask on Hannah's phone. It can't be a coincidence, Samantha replied. Josh sat down across them. What does this all mean? he inquired, glancing from Samantha to Jess. Jess, I need you to tell me what happened the night my sisters died. Start from the beginning and don't even think of lying to me. I'm sorry about what happened to Hannah and Bethany. I didn't want to be a part of all that. Michael forced me. He would have killed me if I refused, informed Jess. What on earth are you talking about? Josh demanded. Sitting across from Jess, he glared at her with hate in his eyes. Jess sighed. Please let me explain. None of this is my fault, she pleaded. It all started a few weeks before the incident. And then she began. Part 3 Jess sat on the couch, listening to blaring rock music, which pulsed loudly from speakers on the table beside her, making the floor of the lodge vibrate. She sat in front of an ornate fireplace, above which the stuffed head of a moose stared down at her, his glassy eyes reflecting her own face back at her like twin mirrors. The fire roared in the hearth, washing the room with its warmth, keeping the cold mountain air at bay. She watched with a bored and annoyed expression as Josh and Samantha made out on the couch across from her, moaning and exploring each other with their hands. The two had been like this for weeks, ever since Hannah had introduced them a few months before. They'd been inseparable, and Jess found it completely annoying. She never wanted to go to the party at the Mountain Lodge without her friends, who normally never left her side. Well, had she known that nearly all of them would have fallen sick the same day, then she would not have agreed to go. Jess stood up from the couch, stretching and glancing across the room, trying to shake off the feeling of annoyance which had rose up inside her. The sitting room was very dark, with the only light in the room coming from a flat-screen TV on the wall. It was tuned to the news, where some reporter droned on about a new fungal infection which had been discovered in Mexico. It was supposedly a very dangerous infection, one that the CDC was investigating. Jess walked past the television, letting the newscaster's voice fall on deaf ears. She'd heard enough of this fear-mongering. It was all her parents ever listened to at home. She walked across the sitting room, past the old grandfather clock on the wall, which told her that it was just after 11.45pm. Jess made her way towards the kitchen, hoping to find some of the booze which Matthew had left in the kitchen. She walked past Christopher, who sat slumped in a chair, having had one too many beers. He snored loudly, an empty bottle lying on the floor next to his foot. Jess scoffed. It seems like some people are unable to hold their liquor, she thought, sneering at Christopher as she went by. 
She made her way to the kitchen, stepping inside and glancing around to see where Matthew had left the beers. Well, Jess was dismayed to be greeted by the sight of Michael, who sat at the kitchen table, as if waiting for her. She felt a rush of anger and fear at seeing Michael again. He was the last person which she'd wanted to encounter. Michael was her ex-boyfriend, and they'd not parted on good terms. Her father had almost called the police on Michael after a particularly scary interaction in which he'd broken into their family home. Michael had been very angry with Jess ever since she'd left him. Due to his, well, terrible attitude and massive ego, well, Michael was a brooding and angry young man, quick to become angry over even the slightest offence, and he was strong as an ox. Working in manual labour for his uncle, a Jesuit priest, who needed his aid around the monastery lifting heavy boxes and other tasks, which the old man had trouble doing himself. Michael sat at the table, smoking a cigarette, which hung from one corner of his mouth, its burning tip illuminating the side of his face, which was fixed in a permanent frown. Hello, Jess. It's been a long time, he muttered, looking at her with his cold, deadpan eyes, she could feel the hate which radiated up from those eyes. Michael was evidently still very angry over her breakup with him. Jess turned to leave, deciding that the beer was not worth encountering Michael for. The last thing she wanted to do was argue with him. She was dismayed to find her path blocked by Emily, Michael's new girlfriend. Emily had once been friends with Jess, up until the point that she'd broken up with Michael. After that, the two had drifted apart, as Emily became moody and withdrawn. She was dressed from head to toe in black, with a pentagram hanging around her neck. Emily glared at Jess with a look of distrust, her eyes narrowing into slits. We need to talk to you now, she demanded. I have nothing to say to either of you, spat Jess, and she moved to push Emily aside, only to be grabbed from behind by Michael, who flung her roughly into a chair. Stop all this nonsense. Emily and I have something to tell you. Something which you're going to listen to, he dictated. What do you want? I told you I wanted nothing to do with you, growled Jess. She moved to stand up only to have Michael shove her back down, even more roughly than he had the first time. Sit down and listen. We need you, Jess. You're going to help us tonight, replied Michael. Emily moved to stand beside Josh, waiting off to the side as he spoke. Tonight we're going to pull a bit of a prank, one that you're going to help us with, Michael instructed. What prank are you talking about? inquired Jess. Oh, we won't share details, it's best if you don't know. All you have to do is deliver a note to Hannah, and we'll take care of the rest, Michael informed her. Jess shook her head. You can't force me to do this. I don't want to talk to you, she stated. Michael was growing annoyed at her refusal. He and Emily had serious plans, and Jess was proving to be a problem for them. He grew tired of her resistance. If she kept it up, he was apt to lose his temper, which meant he might end up hurting her. I'm only going to ask nicely once, he growled, getting in Jess's face. She pulled away from him, glaring back at him, Earth, are you so desperate to pull this prank? Don't the two of you have anything better to do? She inquired. Michael shook his head, taking the note for Hannah from his pocket. Slide this under her door, Michael commanded. Jess took the note from him, shoving it angrily into her pocket. Fine, now leave me be, she replied. Standing up from the table, Jess was shaken by the sight of Michael. He still intimidated her. She recalled with vivid detail the incident which had resulted in her father banning Michael from her home. It had occurred about a week after she'd broken up with him. One Saturday, early in the morning, Jess had awoken to a pounding on her door. Groggily, she'd stumbled downstairs, opening her front door to find Michael glaring at her. What are you doing here? I told you we're finished. Look, stop harassing me. Do you have any idea how early it is? whispered Jess. She was less than pleased that he'd chosen to wake her up so early on a Saturday. She had the door open only part of the way, with a security chain preventing it from fully opening. Jess was about to slam the door shut 
when Michael rammed his shoulder into it, breaking the chain and sending Jess sprawling to the cold floor. Jess had been wearing nothing but a thin nightgown, which meant she had no protection against the cold air which flowed through the door, leaving her shivering on the freezing hardwood floor. Michael had been about to say something when Jess's father burst into the room. What is all this racket? he shouted, glaring over at Michael. He then looked down at Jess, concern growing on his face. She rose to her feet, glaring at Michael. He forced his way into our home. I told him last week that I want nothing to do with him, stated Jess. Her father glared at Michael. What is wrong with you? What makes you think you can just break into my house and scare my daughter like this? I should call the police, and I will if you don't leave now, he barked. Michael paid him no attention, his eyes fixed on Jess. For a moment he stood still, looking her over with predatory eyes, and then he turned and left without speaking a single word. That look in his eyes still unnerved Jess. It had been one of pure evil intent. If her father had not been home, then she shuddered to think what Michael might have done to her. He could be very cruel when angry, which is one of the many reasons she'd broken up with him. Turning her back on Michael and Emily, she stormed out of the kitchen, grabbing one of the beers which Matthew had brought on her way out, barging back into the sitting room, then slamming the door behind her with a loud thud. Christopher was gone, evidently having stumbled off to bed during her interaction with Michael and Emily. The loud sound of the door slamming behind Jess alerted Josh and Samantha, who had been quickly making their way upstairs, hand in hand, preparing to finish what they'd started on the couch in their bedroom. They glanced back in her direction, wondering why she was up so late. After a brief and awkward moment, the two of them continued on their way, heading quickly to their bedroom. And this left Jess alone in the sitting room, with a note in her pocket. Hannah's room was down the hall from the sitting room, across from where Bethany was staying. The twins had likely already gone to bed, as was their usual habit. It was already very late, well past dark, and an eerie silence had settled over the sitting room. All Jess could hear was the quiet ticking of the old grandfather clock on the wall, its constant noise serving to make her even more uneasy. She wished that she'd gone to bed without getting her beer, and perhaps she would never have had that encounter with Michael. Jess walked down the hall to Hannah's door, glancing behind her to see if anyone had noticed her. She didn't want to be seen giving Hannah the note. Taking the note from her pocket, she prepared to slide it under the door, not wanting to anger Michael. Before she slid the paper away, a wave of curiosity gripped her. She wondered just what was on that note. It had to be something specific. Jess had made a decision, choosing to read the note for herself. She wanted to see what sort of prank Michael had in mind. The note was a small, folded slip of paper, one that appeared to have been ripped off from a notebook. Jess unfolded it, using the flickering light of the fireplace to read it. Her brow furrowed when she saw what it was. The note contained only a single symbol, drawn in a dark black ink. The symbol was a representation of the sun, with the letters IHS written below it. Well, this puzzled her to no end. What is this? Is this some sort of inside joke? Why did Michael go to such great lengths to get this to Hannah? She thought. Jess hadn't been expecting the note to be so cryptic. She had no idea what it meant. Shrugging her shoulders, she shoved it underneath Hannah's door, assuming that it was some sort of inside joke between her and Michael, one which only he and Hannah understood. Jess opened her beer, taking a long drink from it as she made her way upstairs, hoping that the alcohol would help her relax. She was tired after a long day, ready to get into a nice warm bed for the night. She didn't understand what was going on between Michael and Hannah, though she was distrustful of Michael. Jess had decided that it was ultimately none of her business. The last thing she wanted was to get involved with Michael again. As she climbed the stairs, Jess glanced behind her, looking back at the sitting room. Much to her astonishment, she could see both Michael and Emily standing motionless in the sitting room, staring up at Jess from behind animal masks. Neither of them spoke, standing side by side, their arms linked, next to the chair in which Christopher had passed out. For a moment, 
She has stood staring at them, her mouth growing dry as she swallowed, her heart pounding in her chest as she became more and more unnerved by the pair of them. She could see their eyes behind the masks, eyes which were devoid of emotion, soulless and cold. What are you two doing? inquired Jess, her voice quivering with fear. Michael raised a single finger, pointing it at Jess. Go to bed, he commanded, in a harsh and angry whisper. Glaring at her with his cold eyes, Jess was shaking as she turned away, nearly tripping on her way upstairs. She stumbled to her room, tossing herself inside and sitting down on her bed. Michael watched Jess leave. He enjoyed the terror and unease on her face. The way she'd fled from him, it brought out a deep predatory instinct in him. One that made him want to chase after her, to silence the loudmouthed girl once and for all. It had taken great pains to get her by herself at the lodge. For weeks he'd followed Jess in her daily commutes, watching where she went and which friends she spent the most time with. He had poisoned several of her friends the morning before Jess travelled to the lodge, to make sure that her little group of friends weren't there to help her when he cornered her in the kitchen. Oh, Michael hated Jess. Finding her loud and annoying, he couldn't believe that he'd actually dated her. Well, it was evident that she was more than a little afraid of him, as she should be, and knowing this brought Michael no small amount of pleasure. This wasn't the first time he'd felt that way, it happened often. His uncle had been part of a very old order, one which was known for its violent nature, using their appearance as benign priests to cover up their terrible deeds. Michael had done many terrible deeds himself. Both he and his uncle had blood on their hands. If Jess failed to do what he'd told her, then he'd likely end up hurting her, as his patience was wearing very thin. Without a word, he stalked forward, making his way through the sitting room, a wide grin spreading over his face. When he listened to the news anchor talk about the new fungal infection, well, Michael hoped that the infection would be deadly, his psychopathic mind conjuring images of all the destruction that such an affliction would cause to the world. Perhaps it would make its way to Canada, where it might infect Jess, silencing her loud mouth forever. He made his way over to the corridor in which Hannah and Bethany's rooms were. Their doors were closed, meaning that they'd already gone to bed for the night. Michael approached the door to Hannah's room, placing an ear against it to hear if she was asleep. He'd instructed her to stay awake. If she was sleeping, then he would be less than pleased with her. Emily was just a few paces behind him, keeping her head down as she walked. They both knew the serious nature of the task which they were to carry out that night. For weeks they'd planned it, convincing Hannah to play a part in it, a task which had been more than a little difficult. As she had been unwilling at first, well, the three of them would be heading into the old mine shafts near the lodge to take part in an occult ritual, one which they'd made Jess and Hannah think was harmless, to stop her from realising just what they intended to do. Michael quietly opened Hannah's door, glancing inside her room to see that she'd been expecting him. Oh, she sat on the bed, wearing the mask which he'd given her. Evidently, she'd received the note from Jess. And this was welcome news. It meant that Michael would no longer have to hurt Jess for failing him. Doing so would have been a difficult task, considering she slept in the next room to Joss and Samantha, who would have certainly heard her screams. Come with me. Keep very quiet. We want no disruptions tonight, whispered Michael. He then left without saying another word, expecting Hannah to keep up with him. He told her to get dressed and be ready to leave the lodge the moment she received the note, as he would be along to collect her soon afterwards. Michael didn't even bother to glance behind him, making his way to the front door of the lodge. It was a cold night, one with a bright full moon in the sky. He quietly opened the door, stepping out into the frigid night air. It was colder than he'd expected. A bit of wind blew through the air, chilling Michael to the bone, even beneath the heavy coat which he wore. Emily and Hannah followed him. As he stepped out into the backyard, his boots were crunching in the snow, and the full moon illuminated the yard around him. 
its silvery light reflecting off the surface of the snow. He looked at the path which led up the side of the mountain. There was an old ranger's tower at its end, one that he and Josh had discovered before, during one of their hikes. Michael led Emily and Hannah down a narrow path, which sloped down the side of Black Mountain, leading the opposite direction to the ranger's tower. This path led to the old mine shaft, one that had been closed many years before, following a deadly mine collapse which had occurred at the turn of the century. Michael had stumbled across the entrance to the mines while out with Josh and a few of their friends. He had been the only one to actually enter the mines. As the rest of his friends had held back, well, Michael blamed Samantha for this, as she had been with them that day. It had been she who had warned Josh against going into the mines, as they were very old with a high likelihood that they might collapse at any moment. Ever since that day, the mines had called to Michael, pulling him in like a moth to a flame. He couldn't explain why. It was as if they held some sort of power, one which he could sense. He knew several people had died in the collapse nearly a century before, and this thought gave him a morbid sense of satisfaction regarding the ritual which he was to perform. He glanced out at the steep rocky path before him, as he carefully hiked down the mountain. One false step, and he'd fall to his death, tumbling down the rocky slope below, breaking his body on a wall of sharp rocks. Michael managed to keep his footing, gripping the stone side of the mountain for support, to keep himself balanced. The entrance to the old mines was just ahead of him. Mere paces away. The entrance was marked by an old mine cart, which had been discarded after the accident many decades before. The cart was now little more than a wreckage of twisted metal and rotting wood. Michael approached the entrance, which had an old sign hanging over it, one that was so badly rusted that he couldn't read what it once said. He pulled a flashlight from his pocket and turned it on, its bright beam illuminating the entrance to the mine shaft. The ceiling of the shaft was held in place by a number of old rotted wood beams, which looked as if they could crumble at any moment. Michael turned to his two companions. Be very careful. Don't bump into any of the pillars. Unless, of course, you want the whole mine to come down on our heads, he stated. Both Emily and Hannah nodded. We'll be careful. You should go first, since you've been in the mines before. Hannah and I will be right behind you, replied Emily. Michael nodded, turning his back to them. He ducked down, stepping into the mine shaft. Its interior was freezing cold and very damp. Water dripped from the ceiling, collecting in puddles on the stone floor, splashing with every step which Michael took, his footfalls echoing on the stone walls around him, making them sound even louder than they really were. He led the way down the narrow shaft, the beam of his flashlight illuminating the area ahead of him. The interior of the cave was pitch black, forcing Hannah and Emily to stay very close to him, or risk getting lost in the darkness that surrounded them. The tunnels within the mines twisted and turned, bringing them deeper and deeper into the mountain. Michael was following an old set of railway tracks, which had once been used to guide minecarts down into the mineral-rich mines, to bring up loads of coal and steel ore. The track went on for some time, until they arrived at a turn in the tunnel, one that led to a much wider chamber. As they walked, a small shack came slowly into view, materializing out of nowhere. The old shack had once been used as a utility shed by the miners, and it was in terrible condition, having been left to the elements since the accident which had caused the mines to be abandoned. The wood which the shack had been built from was badly rotten, to such a degree that Michael often thought that it might fall down at the slightest touch. An old card puncher hung from the side of the shack, having once been used by the workers every day. He scanned the chamber in which they now found themselves with the beam of his flashlight revealing an assembly of broken and rusty machinery, all of which had been part of the former mining operation. The machines were in pieces, having fallen apart many years before. Michael had no idea what each machine had once been used for, as he knew next to nothing about the business of coal mining. The whole cave made Hannah feel uneasy. She glanced over at Michael, her face covered by the animal mask which he'd made her wear. She wished that they'd brought Bethany or Samantha along, 
as she would have preferred to have one of her friends with her in the mines. She hoped that the ritual would be as much fun as Michael had told her it would be, to justify having to walk through these mines, which were cold and unnerving, making Hannah think of horror movies which she and Josh and Samantha had watched. Michael looked past all the ruined machines, at an old elevator, which sat on the far side of the room. It was just as ancient as the machines were, rusted and in bad shape. The first time Josh had travelled to the mines, he had been astonished to find that the elevator still worked. It was likely very unsafe, having not been used in over a hundred years. However, Michael cared very little for his own safety or that of his friends. This way, we'll be taking the lift down to the lower levels of the mine. That's where the ritual will be performed instructed Michael. Are you sure we have to go that deep? The elevator doesn't look even safe. You can't seriously want to use it, Hannah inquired, speaking aloud for the first time since they'd left the lodge. Michael turned to face her, shining his light into her eyes. What did I tell you? He grunted, glaring at her. Hannah raised her hat to shield her eyes from the bright glare of the flashlight. You told me to be silent, Hannah replied, and Michael nodded. Yes, I did, so stop asking questions. Before Hannah could speak to him again, Michael turned his back on her, continuing on his way, surging forward angrily. He regretted even bringing Hannah. She'd never been his first choice, or even his second for that matter. However, he and Emily needed her, as their ritual would be incomplete without her. Michael opened the doors of the elevator grunting with the effort it took to move them. The doors had nearly rusted shut since his last visit, and they gave off a metallic screech as they were forced open. Michael stepped into the elevator, which groaned loudly beneath his weight. The ride down to the lower levels of the mine was silent. Neither Hannah nor Emily dared to speak, not wanting to anger Michael again, when they reached the lower levels of the mines. All of them disembarked the old elevator, shivering in the cold air of the cave. The level which the ritual was to take place in had been prepared ahead of time. Michael had brought down the necessary items, candles, incense, an obsidian dagger and a camera mounted on a tripod to record the ritual. Wait over there, Michael commanded, pointing to the centre of the room. He then lit each candle. There were four in total, one in each corner of the room, representing the four cardinal directions. They each gave off a weak, flickering glow, one which cast long shadows on the stone-cold walls of the mines. With this done, Michael turned on the camera, which sat on a tripod near the elevator. The camera was an expensive model, one which had a night vision mode. Michael closed his eyes, chanting in an unknown language. As he slowly walked to the center of the room, picking up the dagger from the ground, Hannah stood in front of him, fidgeting nervously. What are you doing? She whispered, giving Michael an uneasy look. She could feel that something wasn't right. They told her that the ritual would be fun, that she would enjoy it. So far that had turned out not to be true. Michael was taking it all very seriously, and she now regretted having let him talk her into coming here. She wanted to tell him that she was done, however Michael was having none of it. He motioned to Emily, who grabbed both of Hannah's arms, holding her in place. What is this? You said this would be fun. Let go of me. I'm done. I want to leave, Hannah protested, struggling against Emily's iron grip. Michael gave Hannah a wide and unnerving smile. He had lied to her, not telling her his true intentions. He would never planned a ritual, no, what he wanted was a human sacrifice, to please the dark forces which he served. Hannah would be the first kill he'd made without his uncle being present. It would serve as one of the many rites of passage, required to become a full member of the order which his uncle belonged to. The girl struggled, trying to free herself from Emily's grasp, thrashing about and shouting for help. He raised the dagger above his head, chanting in an ancient tongue, his voice alive with fury and bloodlust. His heart was racing as he prepared to kill yet again, to see the sight of fresh blood and smell its coppery scent in the air. 
The dagger fell, its black blade burying itself in Hannah's chest, cutting through her flesh like butter, silencing her protests and stopping her struggles. Hannah let out a final gasp as her eyes slid closed for the last time. Emily dropped her lifeless body to the stone floor. Stepping over her, both Michael and Emily could feel a surge of power, the act of killing having greatly excited them. There was great power in the spilling of innocent blood. Michael's uncle had proven this to him many times before. Michael's hand shook as he used Hannah's shirt to clean his dagger, being careful not to cut himself when it still raised a sharp edge. He felt like celebrating. Everything had gone just as he hoped that it would. He now stood above Hannah's body, looking down at his handiwork. The girl had bled like a stuck pig, and she now lay in a massive red puddle, which had soaked her clothes entirely. The hard part was over. The girl's body would not be a problem. He doubted that it would even be there for very long, after he and Emily had left. His uncle had told Michael of the creatures which lurked in the mines, cannibalistic monsters known as Wendigo. These creatures craved human flesh, hunting them for sport. Hannah's body would serve as a sacrifice to these monsters. They would devour her whole, removing any evidence of what he had done. He and Emily made their way back to the old lift, listening as a chorus of distant howls drew closer the Wendigo smelling Hannah's blood from further back in the cave. Jess lay in bed, listening to the moans of Josh and Samantha in the next room to hers. Normally the sounds of their lovemaking would have annoyed her no end. However, she was now happy just to know that she was not alone, that there were two people within earshot if she were to yell for help. Jess was still shaken from her encounter with Michael and Emily. The two had left about fifteen minutes before, taking Hannah with them. All three of them had been wearing the bizarre animal masks, making them look downright terrifying in the bright glow of the full moon above. Jess had watched them through the window, trembling with fear, hoping that they would not see her. After walking a short distance, the three of them had disappeared around a downhill corner of a narrow mountain path. Jess had no idea where they intended to go. She'd waited at the window for about ten minutes, wondering when the prank would end. She had no idea what Michael might pull, but knowing him, it would likely be very cruel. Jess had been on the verge of returning to bed when she heard the door downstairs slam. Watching as Bethany stepped out into the yard, shining the bright beam of a flashlight around her backyard. She was searching for her sister, as she'd been awoken by the sound of the back door slamming shut. Bethany jogged over to the narrow path which Michael and Hannah had gone down before her, evidently following a set of footprints left in the snow. Jess watched her disappear around the same corner her sister had, wondering what would happen if Bethany were to confront Michael. It was at this point that Jess had had enough. She returned to her warm bed, sliding beneath the blankets, hoping that she could manage to drift off to sleep. It took her several minutes, but eventually she calmed down, relaxing enough to fall into a restless sleep. Samantha and Josh stared at Jess with amazement. So, you saw Michael and Emily go into the mines with my sisters? inquired Josh. He stared at Jess with disbelief. Jess nodded. Yes, both of your sisters went into the mines. Neither of them came out. I tried to tell the police that Michael was involved in what had happened, but they refused to even hear me out. When I told them about the note which I'd been forced to give Hannah, they tried to convince me that it was all a dream, Jess said. Josh hung his head, staring down at his feet. This was the first time he'd heard the full story. At first, he dismissed his sister's death as a prank gone wrong, something that his former group of friends had done out of spite. Now, he understood that nearly all of it had been the sole responsibility of Michael and Emily. None of this makes sense. Why would the police not listen to you? You had proof against Michael. They should have charged him. Ah, 
It makes more sense now. Someone very high up in the police was working with Michael. This explains why we stumbled across Hannah's cell phone out in the forest. There was never a real investigation. The RCMP knew who the killer was. Someone helped cover Michael's tracks, reasoned Josh. Samantha and Jess exchanged a glance. If it's true, then who helped Michael get away with what he did, and why? inquired Samantha. Josh was about to reply when the sound of breaking glass broke the silence, causing all three of them to leap to their feet and turn to face the door. Part 4 Samantha had drawn her sword as she rose to her feet, startled by the sound of breaking glass behind her. Someone had thrown a brick through one of the lodge's front windows, creating a mess on the floor, which was now covered by shattered glass and snow. A freezing cold wind blew inside through the open window, sending shivers down Samantha's spine. A voice from outside called to Josh making him react with rage when he realized who it was. Go out, Josh. I need to speak with you, shouted Michael. Josh reacted quickly, grabbing his shotgun from where he'd left it and charging outside, stopping only to flip on the lodge's exterior lights. Josh, wait. This could be a trap, Samantha had shouted in an attempt to warn Josh, who ignored her shout. Too angry to pay attention to what she was saying, his desire to confront his sister's killers, drowning out everything else. Samantha and Jess stood silently for a moment, as Michael and Josh began to argue outside, shouting at each other in an incensed tone. Samantha sighed, turning to face Jess, who still stood in the same spot. Come with me, we have to try and help Josh, whispered Samantha. She walked across the living room to the small glass cabinet where Josh's father had kept his guns. Pulling it open, inside he found a bolt-action rifle which his father had used to hunt. Samantha retrieved this gun, picking it up and looking it over. It was still in good condition, despite the fact that it had not been fired for several months. The rifle had been cleaned and oiled before being stored, since Josh made a habit of keeping his guns in working order. Samantha pulled back the bolt, checking to see if it was loaded. She let out a groan of annoyance when she saw that the rifle had no ammunition. Here, yeah, take this, Samantha directed, handing the gun to Jess. She then began to search the cabinet, pulling open drawers and looking beneath spare boxes of shotgun shells. The rifle had only really been used a few times. Josh's father preferred to hunt with a shotgun, as he mostly hunted rabbits. Samantha managed to find a single box of 22 250 ammunition, which she was fairly certain would work in the rifle. She rose to her feet, handing Jess the box of shells. It was only about half full, which meant that she had about 11 rounds in total. Jess looked at Samantha with confusion. What am I supposed to do with this? She inquired, holding up the gun in her arms. Come with me, I'll show you, Samantha replied. She closed the cabinet, leading Jess up to the second floor. Outside, Josh and Micah were screaming at each other in a heated argument over what had happened to his sisters. Well, Samantha hoped that she and Jess could get into position before anyone started shooting. She had no idea if Michael had brought back up. If he had, then Josh could be in danger. She arrived on the second floor, making her way silently down the hallway. There was a spare bedroom at the end of the hall, one which overlooked the lodge's front porch. It was here that Samantha intended to leave Jess, to give she and Josh covering fire. She reached the door to the spare bedroom, pushing it open with a soft squeak from its worn hinges. The spare room was only sparsely decorated, having nothing but a bed inside, one that had no sheets or pillows upon it. It had hardly ever been used, as most guests of the lodge had stayed on the first floor. Samantha made her way over to the window, peering down to see what was happening outside. The sun was on the verge of setting, which meant that they had less than ten minutes of light left. Josh stood on the porch, aiming his shotgun at a group of men, who had surrounded the lodge. The men were all dressed in black body armor, 
with the symbol of the sun painted on their breastplates in white. The men's faces were covered by black canvas hoods. There were about six of them in total, all with their guns pointed at Josh. Michael stood in the center of all the men. Emily stood beside him, both of them arguing with Josh. Samantha was unable to hear what they were saying, however, the tone of their voices let her know that the argument would soon come to a head. She glanced over her shoulder, motioning for Josh to come and join her. Load the rifle and wait here by the window. If you see anyone try and shoot Josh or me, you start shooting first, instructed Samantha. Jess walked over to the window, her fingers shaking as she loaded the rifle. She'd only ever shot a gun once, and that had been with BBs. Try to aim for the chest. It may not kill them right away, but it should at least slow them down, whispered Samantha. She left Jess then by the window, closing the spare room's door behind her. Samantha then crept down the hall, intent on slipping out the back door. She had to get closer to Josh to see if there were any way that she could help him. Samantha had a few smoke bombs on hand, which would prove useful if she had to engage the men with Josh. As she descended the stairs yet again, a sound from outside made her quicken her pace, her heart racing as she realized what it was. The infected had found the lodge evidently having been drawn in by the loud argument between Josh and Michael. Machine gun fire ripped through the air as one of the men guarding Michael let out a scream. Samantha was sprinting now, running as fast as her legs could carry her. She slammed out the back door of the lodge, stepping out into the dwindling late afternoon sunlight. She circled back round to the front where fighting had broken out. Dozens of infected had swarmed out of the thick forest, attacking both Josh and Michael's men. The front yard was a scene of carnage. Three of the black-clad men lay dead, their throats torn out by the infected. Josh, Michael, Emily and the final black-clad men were all fighting the infected, firing widely. Josh blew one of the infected attackers' heads apart with a blast of buckshot, pulverizing its skull glanced around the yard, stopping his gaze when he saw Samantha. What are you doing here? He shouted, pumping his shotgun to eject a spent shell onto the snowy ground. Samantha didn't reply. Instead, she began to make her way over to Josh, who had refocused his attention on the infected attacking he and Michael. Samantha heard the crunching of snow to her left, followed by a loud snarl. She spun to face her attacker, a large, infected man, dressed in the clothes of a construction worker. Drawing her sword, she delivered a cut across his chest, one which knocked the would-be attacker back into the snow. Covering the white surface with his blood, the sound of shrieks and gunshots filled the air. As the group prepared to deal with the rest of their attackers, their grudge against each other temporarily forgotten. Samantha moved towards Josh, flicking the blood from her sword with a snap of her wrist. She hoped to get to him before either Michael or Emily could attempt treachery. She still didn't trust either of them. If what Jess had told her was true, then Michael had been the last person to speak to Josh's sisters. Michael fired a burst of automatic fire at a group of infected, killing two of them and hitting a third in the leg, causing it to fall to the ground. He then tried to mow down two other infected, dropping his magazine and slapping in a fresh one from his belt. However, the other two infected were too fast for him. They came very close to Michael and would have killed him had Emily not shot them at the last second. This annoyed Samantha, as she hoped that Michael might be bitten. She surged forward, finding a path blocked by two infected, a man and a woman, both dressed in drab, grey jumpsuits, with numbers on the back of them. They rounded on Samantha, screeching at her with rage. She stepped forward to meet them, her blade moving to combat the first attacker. With a single, well-placed strike, she sliced the man's head in two, killing him before he could reach her. He fell off to the side, leaving only the woman to contend with. Samantha refused to allow her time to attack, burying her blade in the woman's chest, then yanking it back out. She gurgled and fell to her knees, allowing Samantha to deliver a slice across her throat. 
Now she stood next to Josh, who was reloading his shotgun. Most of the small horde of infected had been dealt with, mowed down by their combined firepower. Only a few still remained. A single burst of automatic fire from Michael ended most of them, leaving only a single infected off to their right. Samantha moved quickly forward, stabbing the final attacker in the head. She then spun to face Michael and Emily, who were staring at Samantha with an impressed look. Wow, Sam, I never knew you were so good with a sword. I guess you and Christopher must have played more Dungeons and Dragons than we thought, purred Emily in a mocking tone. She ejected the magazine from her pistol, loading in her last one. Always had a thing for blades, Samantha replied. She knelt down next to the infected, using the rags he wore to wipe her blade clean before sheathing it. Emily scoffed, giving Samantha a tedious glare. Enough small talk, she growled, rounding on Josh. You know what we came here for. Give us Jess and we'll leave, she demanded. Josh shook his head, glaring daggers at Emily. No, I won't help you, not after what you did to my sisters, he barked, pointing his shotgun at Michael yet again. Emily moved to point her gun at Josh, only to be stopped by the feeling of cold steel pressed against her throat. Her eyes widened as she gave Samantha a shocked look, their eyes meeting for a brief moment. Holster it, demanded Samantha, keeping the point of her blade on Emily's throat. Emily lowered her gun, sliding it back into its holster before raising both her hands. Oh, take it easy, Sam. I don't know what Jess told you, but what happened to Hannah was Michael's idea, not mine, Emily pleaded. Shut up, Michael spat. He wanted to slap Emily then and there, but didn't want Josh shooting him. For a moment, all was silent with the only audible sound being the wind blowing through the forest around them. Tell us what happened now, demanded Josh. Michael refused to answer, standing his ground, even at the end of a gun. No, we owe you no explanation, he retorted, preparing to attack Josh, no longer caring if Emily died in the crossfire. As the sun above them set... Michael gripped his machine gun, slowly raising it to his shoulder. He wanted to end Josh, so that he could capture Jess and go home. Josh surged forward, putting the barrel of his shotgun directly against Michael's skull. Don't even think of raising that rifle. Tell me something right now. Did you do it? Did you kill them? Did you kill Hannah and Bethany? Josh shouted. Michael gave him an emotionless expression. Yes, we did. Both of us. Emily held her while I plunged a dagger into her heart, he replied. Samantha stared at Emily with disbelief, letting what she'd just heard sink in. Hannah had been her best friend, the one who'd introduced her to Josh. Had it not been for her, she and Josh would never have even met. Hannah's loss had been devastating, something that had changed Samantha's life forever, robbing her of her closest friend. Why did you do it? What did Hannah ever do to you? shouted Samantha. She pressed her blade closer to Emily's throat, waiting to hear what she'd say in her defense. Emily refused to answer, as she slowly inched her hand towards her pistol, hoping that Samantha wouldn't notice. She silently drew it while keeping her eyes locked with Samantha. She had to die. It was the only way. Her death completed the ritual, Emily explained. Samantha's eyes narrowed, her hands shaking with rage. That's it? That's all you have to say for yourself? You helped kill Hannah over some stupid ritual? She shouted. Emily pointed her pistol at Samantha's gut, hoping that shooting her would make her drop her sword. Her finger brushed the trigger, preparing to shoot. Samantha noticed the gun pointed at her. Stop. Don't even try it. I guarantee I can slice your throat before you pull that trigger. 
she growled, preparing to end Emily for good. And she would have, had a gunshot not exploded from the second floor of the cabin as Jess fired at Emily, hitting her in the shoulder. Emily dropped the pistol she'd been holding to the ground as a stream of blood ran down her arm. She glared at Samantha, wishing that their roles were reversed, that she was the one with her blade to Samantha's throat. She was about to shout some insult into Samantha's face when a sudden roar erupted from the forest behind them, causing them all to spin in its direction. More infected, growled Michael, growing angry at the interruptions to his task. A grey blur bounded into sight, moving faster than any infected Samantha had ever seen. It looked like a skeletal, thin, grey humanoid, one with glowing yellow eyes. It came at them with a supernatural fury, clearing the distance between them with just a few bounds. The creature took hold of Emily, grabbing her by the neck and choking her. Wendigo! screamed Michael. He fired on the beast with his gun, an action which had little effect on it, as it increased the pressure on Emily's neck. Samantha leapt into action, wielding her sword once again. She slashed at the creature's arm, severing it at the elbow. The Wendigo shrieked in shock and agony, receiving another slash from her bastard sword, this time across its face, blinding one of its eyes. The Wendigo threw itself backwards, scrambling to escape the reach of Samantha's sword, a weapon it had yet to encounter. It shrieked for help, calling for its brethren to come to its aid. Samantha fell back, no longer caring if Michael and Emily escaped. All she could hear was the roars of the Wendigo from all directions. She and Josh retreated to the lodge, leaving Michael and Emily to die. They could hear their combined yells for help, followed by a barrage of gunshots, as they slammed the lodge's front door behind them, barricading it with an old rocking chair which sat in the corner. Help me board up the window. Those things can't be allowed to get in, shouted Josh. He and Samantha rushed over to find something with which they could secure the broken window, running frantically about. They uncovered a few planks of wood left over from a past building project, done by Josh's father. The boards had been shoved into a closet, where they'd been forgotten up until that point. Josh used these boards to secure the window, nailing them in place with the few old nails he'd found in a kitchen drawer. After the boards were in place, Jess came down from upstairs, still carrying the rifle Samantha had handed her. I saw what happened out there. What on earth was that thing? She inquired, glancing from Josh to Samantha. That thing was a wendigo. I read about them. They're supposed to have been only a legend, one told by the First Nations people replied Samantha. Jess sat down across from them, placing the rifle across her lap. I saw Emily and Michael run off into the woods. A bunch of those Wendigos went after them. I don't think they'll make it. Those things are so strong. It's like nothing I've ever seen, she said. Good. They killed my sisters. Hopefully those things will rip them apart, growled Josh. He stood up, deciding that he'd make a fire in the living room to ward off the remaining Wendigos. For a while, they all sat in front of the fire, listening to the sound of the rushing wind outside. Eventually, all of them went to bed, deciding that they would leave the following morning to travel to a safer place than the lot. Okay, okay, crazy short end credit sequence today so that I can make sure that I clock in at exactly two hours. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you into my little secret of how I make these videos land right on the dot. And so, um, oh, I haven't got much time. Gonna have to stop speaking soon. More long stories to come. Really tired after this one. Uh, voice is all croaky, but there will be another long one. Well, next week probably, if not before. Um, more werewolves or assholes coming along, and reverse vampires. Remember that one? One of my favourites, and there is um, a huge new episode of that coming, and more 
Vietnam stories, and other stuff. Oh, God. Ah, so much stuff lined up, I can't even think about what I'm going to do next. Anyway, enough of me for one evening. Time to round it off at two hours, and here we go. Oh.